Okay, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Peter Grossoff to uh, our clients. Uh, Peter is the CEO of Sprott Inc. And I mentioned that we're going to have Peter as a special guest uh, to our presentation today. Now, Sprott, many of you know this, but just to reiterate, they're really a global leader in the precious metals and other mining commodities. Uh, and uh, they have a very large presence in uh, physical trusts, publicly traded security, especially in the precious metals and resource sector. They're also very large in terms of lending and private equity. And they've also been expanding in the royalty and streaming business. Uh, Peter's been the CEO of the company now for, uh, I guess, 10 years, uh, close right. to 10 years. And uh, we appreciate um, the work that he's done there. This is a very unique company. I love their contrarian approach. They're exceptionally innovative and creative in terms of their products. And I know you're going to enjoy the presentation uh, that Peter has for us. So with that, Peter, I'm going to share your presentation on the screen and uh, turn it over to you. Okay. Well, great, Jonathan. Um, we're delighted to be here. We've uh, also followed your firm for a long time and even prior to your uh, career at, at, at your, your, your present firm that you're building. And um, I know that you're uh, very sophisticated in terms of your views on gold and, and we're just uh, honored to be part of uh, your, your presentation to your clients today. So maybe I'll just start by um, introducing myself. I've been the CEO of, of Sprott for 10 years, um, Jonathan, as you, as you mentioned. Uh, prior to that, I had about 20 years in varying roles servicing the precious metal industry, starting actually as a gold and commodities trader, moving into investment banking, and then I ran a couple of investment dealers that specialized in resource stocks. So I've always been a part of the industry, been a part of financing the industry. I know a lot of the personalities and CEOs in the business. And over time, I can say I've gravitated more and more to the views of our founder, Eric Sprott, in um, you know, kind of championing gold's role in a portfolio. So just to talk about that for a second on the next slide, um, I, I think it's important to start by talking about performance. So not many people realize what gold has done historically. Over long periods of time, it has outperformed many of the financial instruments that you would ordinarily think are cornerstones of a portfolio, including stocks and including bonds. And um, what I can say is that for individual periods of time, when, when the bull markets are roaring in, in credit or, or, or equities, it can underperform significantly, but over long periods of time, most people don't realize how well gold is done on a portfolio basis. I would reiterate that, and I haven't brought up the slide here with respect to currencies, and that's perhaps the most important view that we have on gold. Gold is not a risk asset per se. It is, in our view, it is a counter currency, it's a counter fiat currency, and it's a valid currency. So I'll give you a few statistics. First of all, in the past 10 years, gold has performed um, almost every major currency, outperformed almost every major currency uh, in almost every one of those 10 years. Over a long period of time, 20 to 30 years, it has outperformed every fiat currency. And um, I guess most people compare it against the US dollar because they're, they're inversely related. On occasion, again, the U.S. dollar can outperform gold when things are going particularly well for the U.S. and its financial markets, but over longer periods of time, gold has held its value better. And that's, that's the perspective that we come at, at gold from, is, is, is that it really is a hedge to the financial markets and it's a hedge to the uh, current economic policies, the monetary and fiscal policies of, of governments. So just uh, turning to the, the next page, just to talk about that for a second, which is really uh, gold's hedge in terms of um, a, a more diversified financial portfolio. It has done very well over long periods of time, acting as a counter cyclical um, risk off asset to equity and bond portfolios. And there's one major change in this picture in the last year. 
with a 30 mar 30 year credit market boom slowly winding its way to a, a close here and with long term rates now in the kind of 0.6 percent range we have entered a period of financial repression and that in terms of a bond side of a portfolio is basically a guaranteed way to lose money in addition bonds have become increasingly correlated with stocks and general financial markets so contrary to uh, what you would have thought uh, in periods of extreme risk bonds are actually going into sell off mode in terms of being um, correlated with with financial markets they don't serve as a proper equity hedge as they used to anymore and we think that gold will slowly uh, take their place in, in terms of a risk diversification asset. Um, moving to the track record on the next page just of, of how it protects portfolios and events of crisis we, we show you uh, here uh, many of the uh, counter um, market equity risk events that have occurred over the past 10 years and we can see that gold does outperform other asset classes when you get these bumps in the market. So just in terms of portfolio theory, in terms of having uh, a counter currency in your portfolios, we would say that in normal times, perfect portfolio theory math, gold should be a 5% holding. And that's in normal times. And um, what what we uh, came into this business to try and do at Sprott is to convince investors that that should be the case, that gold was no longer a fringe asset and that it had a valuable diversification aspect within your portfolios. And that kind of brings us to uh, the current times and the next slide. And um, what is happening now, and we've been talking about this and kind of with increasing alarm in the last two years, is that uh, monetary policy has started to, uh, to, to, to infiltrate every aspect of the financial markets. And it was already occurring uh, two or three years ago where uh, the major central banks were talking about releasing their hold on on the economies and we're talking about gradually tightening and normalizing monetary policy and we were adding up the numbers on the debt loads across the various forms of both government and uh, pension deficit um, debt that was going to come due and and uh, in individual consumer debt at the consumer level and we were just saying to ourselves this equation is already so stretched how can they possibly say they're going to get back to normalization and get back to tightening? The economy, which after 10 years of fiscal st of, and monetary stimulus has been growing at 2% per year. Now that's not bad, but it's not great. And if you start to tighten interest rates in that kind of environment with the debt loads the way they were, it's a pretty simple mathematical equation. X, which is at record levels, times Y, which is at record low levels, that's the interest rate, is already a debt burden which can barely be afforded. So how can they raise Y and still be solvent? They can't. So we were talking about this uh, upwards of a year ago, and we noted that the Fed pivoted mid last year and admitted basically that they could not afford to tighten and so it became very interesting. It became very interesting for gold because if, if, if interest rates can't normalize, then what does that say for monetary policy? It, need, it, it says it needs to remain super accommodative. It needs to uh, possibly get into a period of financial repression with negative rates continuing for a long period of time with no way out of it in the short term. Just very, very positive for gold. Then what happened was COVID, as everyone knows, and that just accelerated and in fact, in fact acted as a pin to the global debt balloon that had developed. And unfortunately, the economy, the consumers, even most corporations were in no way prepared to handle any stress in their system 
because they had become so dependent on the liquidity that had been offered by governments for now 10 years running. And with no room to move, the Fed, the governments, central planners had to move in in force and help people out. And this has absolutely ballooned, uh, you know, we call it going nuclear with the, with the deficits and going nuclear with the Fed balance sheet. Um, unprecedented stimulus. The numbers that we have run with our various advisors are that between the ECB and the Fed alone, that they may well hit $20 trillion of central bank um, balance sheet funding because they are becoming the, the buyers of last resort of their own government debt. And that is a very dangerous cycle. Um, we noted towards the end of last year already, the Fed had been swooping in at the end of the U.S. Treasury auction, um, Treasury auctions on a weekly basis and, and starting to offer the dealers accommodation so that they could hold U.S. Treasury bonds and then were in fact issuing bills to finance those U.S. Treasury auctions. They were already out of buyers for U.S. Treasuries. So with this amount of deficit funding that you see on your screen here, there is no, there is no other alternative than for the central banks to step in and mop up most of that treasury issuance. And I've outlined that on a few bullets on the next page. Uh, we believe that um, these liquidity injections will become large and permanent and that the, essentially this is serving now to socialize the bond markets. The bond markets are no longer operating normally. The Fed and, and the other central banks are crowding them out. And we're entering a period that can be, I think, justifiably called uh, yield curve control. Rates are going to be pinned at these levels. And if customers want to hold bonds, if you want to hold a treasury bond, you're going to be holding it in a negative real rate environment. It is a certificate that will become a certificate of confiscation. And there's, there's no secret about that. The Fed has basically said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to spur inflation while we're pinning uh, rates at under the rate of that inflation. So that's what a treasury bond is now. It's a certificate of confiscation for the foreseeable future. And, you know, in that environment, gold becomes not just a mandatory um, hedge at, at the 5% level. We think it should be, you know, upped in portfolios uh, to a much higher level to account for the fact that uh, this experiment, this, this huge monetary experiment that we're in, could end very badly. It, it could either end in, in, in crushing deflation, which we're seeing in the short term, or it could end up in runaway inflation, which you know may may in fact benefit some stocks and some assets, but in general should massively benefit gold. And uh, holding gold as a as a as a big hedge in that environment is 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 a wise strategy. Uh, lastly, credit deflation. Um, this is what we're seeing now with the the hangover of this ten years of of massively. Uh, blown credit bubble. Um, the the corporations of, of, of the world have been issuing credit um, to, to very large percentage numbers and including uh, financing the, the private equity buyouts and the, the stock buybacks that have really fueled the stock market. And what we can see here is that uh, credit investors, professional credit investors are not amused. I mean, they know what's coming. And the credit markets have, have suffered a massive setback. Spreads have suffered a massive setback, as you would think. And, um, you know, the old adage comes to mind here, which is um, both markets can't, can't be wrong, can't, can't be moving in the same direction or, sorry, opposite directions for long. When you have credit markets acting this poorly, you, you cannot have equity markets not suffering some um, bouts of nervousness and setback as well. And what we know is that in various tranches in, in, in the credit universe, this hangover is going to be um, long and hard to, to, to suffer through. We're talking about a period of 
a year to two years of fairly significant restructuring where a lot of high yield deals are, are, go are going to uh, have to be restructured. A lot of fallen angels uh, will, will um, fall out of investment grade st status and, and that process despite the fact that the Fed is, is going to you know, purchase individual securities now, which is a, 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 an unprecedented expansion of their mandate, I think this process is going to be a long, hard process on the credit side. And then lastly, just in terms of gold and how we ha have seen it, uh, gold equities uh, should provide excellent leverage to the gold price. Now, uh, gold Gold equities were, were not in a very healthy position in 2010 after the uh, last crisis. They uh, appreciated to record highs. They had entered into a period of massive capital expenditures. They had completed a lot of mergers at the top of the cycle. And they were just generally in poor condition with blo bloated balance sheets, with CapEx programs that were runaway. And, and they needed a long time to get healthy again. And that, that occurred for them, unfortunately, during a, a bear market from 2011 to 2016, 17. During that time, they made a lot of hard choices. They shrunk their balance sheets. They got in a lot healthier condition to the effect that now, even before this recent gold rally, gold equities had very healthy margins. You're, you're talking about companies that could produce a 30% margin over the long term, not including the record gold prices that we've seen in not only US dollars, but Canadian and, and Australian dollars. So you've now got companies that in general can for, for good projects can produce 50% plus EBITDA margins and um, sh are, are poised through the natural operating leverage that they have in their income statements to outperform most other equities in this environment. So here's an industry that's healthy, that's in expansion mode um, with a limited resource on the other side. So you can't build gold mines quickly. You can't find them anymore. And they're in limited supply. But the, the global major companies have them under their ownership. And they are poised to put in kind of record cash flow and earnings growth while other sectors are dealing with the effects of COVID. So this is... Um, going to be a very good area. It's already appreciated to a certain extent, but nowhere near the extent that it has in past rallies. The average gold price rally from bottom to top is about 300%. We're about 50 to 60% into that. So there's lots of time to pick good gold stocks. Paradoxically, the junior gold stocks have hardly rallied at all. They have still been dealing with the um, the effects of their their 10-year bad uh, bear market the amount of investors that are willing to pick junior gold stocks are very limited and so you've got this real barbell where at the junior end of the market you've got lots of bargains that can be had and at the senior end of the market you've got lots of healthy large companies and we think that also makes for a good m a catalyst rich market um, that that should occur with the, the gold shares Uh, so our outlook is that um, gold is one of the few assets that offers great downside protection and uh, protection away from deflationary events, which we're going through that kind of a shock now, and then also upside potential during the new financial landscape and during um, the, the probability that eventually inflation will come back into the picture. Even though gold's performed well, we think it is poised to continue to outperform. I think the charts are all solidly indicating a, uh, a $2,000 price by the end of the year. That would be a, a big percentage gain from here, but uh, we can see the, the, the futures leading the way, the Russian to physical gold leading the way. It's still very under-owned and underutilized by m most retail investors and institutions. And um, we think it will be a very good environment to be overweighted towards gold in, in the coming year or two. 
Uh, so I'll maybe just give you a quick overview on Sprott because I know Jonathan has a position and has been interested in our company. Uh, we're a very unique company. We're a publicly traded asset manager. We are certainly one of the world's largest precious metal focused and managers. We're the only um, precious metal focused manager that is kind of at the the, the level of commitment that we are for the sector was about 90% of our assets plus are in precious metals. Uh, we took the view to sell all the non-precious metal funds that we had to uh, Nine Point Asset Management. Uh, we still manage their precious metal fund. And we, did, we made that move two years ago because we committed to being the best globally in precious metals. And that allowed us to pick up a lot of talent and to buy some of our competitors while the markets were really low one, two, and three years ago. And the theme that I've had since I've got to the company is if you could be the best at precious metals, it could be a really good area uh, for global leadership. Nobody else was doing it. <clears throat> gold is a uh, one thing I haven't said yet is gold is a surprisingly big market. It's an eight trillion dollar market, of which about a trillion and a half is available for investors. The vast majority of that is bullion, but it's a big area, and to, to be the best in that area can can deliver a lot of rewards. We think so. That's why we did it. Of course, we started with uh, a, a big hand and running start uh, through our founder, Eric Sprott, who's still one of the most prolific, well-known precious metal investors. My, my idea was to put together the DNA of the world's best gold investors into one firm. And I thought we should do that on the bullion side, we should do that on the equity side, on the hedge fund side, and even going into private strategies. So we amalgamated investors like uh, Eric Sprott, Rick Rule, Whitney George, Paul Stevens, uh, who, who found, was the founder of RS uh, Investments in, in the U.S. and one of the largest global resource investors, uh, was on our board for a while. Uh, John Hathaway now, who's joined us through the Tocqueville acquisition. And to amalgamate all of that expertise at running precious metals and to try and systemize the best way to do that for various types of investors was what our mandate was. So we started turning the firm around uh, about two years ago. I think we made some, some very prolific and, and important acquisitions and we're now up to about 10 billion, uh, 10, 10.5 billion US in assets under management. We have a great, on the next page, you can show what our, um, our silos are, we have a great physical precious metals franchise. We offer that through three products that are listed on the New York Stock Exchange, our physical gold, silver, and platinum and palladium businesses. They are all 100% physically backed. That is a very important distinction between us and our competitors. They're liquid. <clears throat> they have a tie to the, to the, to the gold spot price. And they also offer a long-term tax advantage for U.S. holders. So we, we really believe in these products. We believe in our the, the marketing and investor system that we have that services this business. We have developed, the, in my opinion, the Cracker Jack sales team and service team in, in, in that area. And we should be able to add more um, commodities and, and physical mining commodities to that over time. We also have active gold equities management where we have mutual funds in both Canada and the US. And we also have ETF funds in the US which allow us to offer any equity investor with easy access to the equities on the gold side. We have the, uh, well, I'll talk about our gold team in, in a slide or two but we've assembled the world's broadest team at investing in gold equities. 
And so that that uh, gives you the idea there in terms of our equity products. Our investment team um, is not only experienced and, and broad in terms of our global approach to investing in gold equities, but we have technical advisors um, who can uh, give us the goods on any of the companies that we're investing in. And we have a very experienced executive team on the gold uh, investment side. Um, our AUM, as I mentioned, started to grow a, a, a couple of years ago, and uh, we've been just solidly building the firm up over the last year. As you can imagine, the last few months we've been uh, kind of run off our feet. There's been a lot of interest in gold. People want to know how it's acting compared to other asset classes. Some people want to hide in gold. Some people want to know about the physical market. So our team has been very busy fully virtually plugged in fortunately we're deemed to be a, uh, an essential service and so we just have not slowed down at all in this environment we just continue to build the firm and then i think on the last page and maybe my summary for our shareholders is that we have three things that we're really trying to do for our investors we're obviously heavily tied to this theme <clears throat> of, of precious metal investing. And I'd say, for starters, we have a strong balance sheet and we pay a uh, substantial dividend. So no matter what happens to gold, we want to tell our investors, we'll pay you to wait and we'll pay you as another high dividend company would pay you. We want you to remain a long-term committed shareholder uh, to, to Spry. The second thing is we will benefit from bullion price increases. So if the price of gold is going up, our assets are going up just by virtue of how they're denominated. And we will benefit from having the same margin on a greater amount of assets. The second thing is during a period of interest in gold, as we have now and probably will for a few years, we'll benefit from inflows. We've learned how to, how to grow our funds inside and outside of the financial system we deal with wirehouses we deal with banks but we also deal with direct investors and i think that's an important distinction we can take inflows no matter what happens globally uh, based on the the funds that we have now and we are aimed globally we have a presence in europe we have a small presence in asia and we have the overwhelming presence in, in, in the US now and, and Canada. Um, and then lastly, when things are going really well, we have performance fees on many of our funds. And for those of you that were shareholders back in 2010, you can re remember that the, 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 our share, share price then was much higher. It was in the um, kind of seven to $10 range. And the reason for that was we had some outstanding years on performance fees. So once we get two or three years of good performance behind our back, we start to hit those high water marks. Our funds start to pay performance fees. In 2010, we had a year where we made over a hundred million in performance fees. And that's really the, um, the, the, the last point of leverage that we have for our shareholders. We share those performance fees with our, um, with our management teams, but shareholders get the benefit as well so that we're all aligned. And um, that's that's really the, the reason why to hold us uh, through a, a, a good precious metal market. So I'll close the presentation with that. I've gone on more than long enough. Uh, maybe turn it back to Jonathan if you wanna ask any questions or I'd certainly be open to having follow-up calls with either yourself or any of your uh, investors, if that's the easiest way to handle it. I should note, we're in a quiet period now. I really can't talk about our results. Uh, we're gonna be reporting in a couple of days, but I'm happy, happy to answer general questions. Yeah, Peter, uh, th thank you very much. That was an exceptional uh, overview of the gold market and sort of, in, in particular, how Sprott is uniquely positioned to take advantage of. I've really admired the way you really focus the company as you say in the last couple of years just a couple of quick questions that uh, I think some of our investors would have um, first of all you talked about certificates of confiscation and uh, I think that's what a lot of our investors are worried about that uh, it really there's no interest rate and 
as you pointed out, um, there really can't be an increase in interest rate. Um, I mean, they're really going to be forced to keep rates very, very low and also try to spike inflation, which means uh, negative real uh, interest rates, which would be devastating for savers. And uh, yeah. that's, what, that's what you're seeing. I talk to our investors about that all the time, but it's really going to be impossible to get out of this uh, without some kind of pain. Well, yeah, you, you know, to... to Put it in general terms, it's not as though you need to run from bonds with your hair on fire. I mean, th these are going to be cash parking exercises, which are very similar to money market funds or other ways of getting, you know, a 1% a interest rate um, if you're lucky and you do good work on it. Um, we, we do not think that that stands a very good chance against inflation. So, yes, you will lose. On a on a real basis, but you're not going to be losing on a on a on a nominal basis. Um, then you have a choice: uh, Do you go into equities and you know try and buy some well-priced cash flows and well-run company, or do you take risk on the credit side and get into an interest instrument which has a, you know a much greater spread, where you're really taking a quasi-equity risk, and you can find good instruments there too I'm, I'm pretty sure or do you get into a real alternative like gold or uh, you know real estate or something that's completely different but I, I just think we've, we've basically gotten to the point where bonds as an asset class at the sovereign level with no spread on them are, are just it's it's a it's a cash parking exercise one of the biggest reasons that people would uh, you know go against gold or say it wasn't a good investment <laughs> it doesn't earn any interest or just you know it doesn't uh, generate any income in, in, and I'm speaking here in terms of bullion but in this case now um, with interest rates so low that argument just disappears which makes the precious metals so much more attractive to protecting your capital against uh, the, the you know, devaluation of fiat currencies which is inevitably going to have to happen yeah and I, I don't want to be too cheeky about that point it has been the number one institutional um, you know, kind of a objection to gold. There was an investment conference we attended three months ago where the institutions were actually, these were real asset investors, professionals, um, and they were polled, does, you know, what, what what role does gold have in your portfolio? Most of them said gold has no role in our portfolio because it doesn't generate interest as a, as a starting point. And our counterpoint to that is it's not supposed to generate interest. It's supposed to be a risk-free asset. Now, it's gotten a lot cheaper to hold than it used to be. But if you want to take your gold and then invest it in risk assets, then go buy a gold bond or go buy, you know, Barrick or, or a gold equity. That, that, that then becomes a risk-paying investment. Gold itself should not be viewed that way. From your global perch, I know you have a unique. Uh, you're, you, see, you sit in a unique position to see where some of the the increasing demands coming because I think in the past there was a certain demographic for the gold investor, but over the last little while, I've heard you speak on a number of occasions of a real shift taking place as you travel around the world, um, not just here in North America but also in Europe, in the Far East, China, and so on. So maybe, maybe you can just sort of where is where do you see some of the largest pockets of demand coming from? Uh, and what, what you would be looking for over the next uh, you know, 12 to 18 months? Um, yeah, it, each, each um, part of the world has a, a distinct view to, to gold. Um, <clears throat> I think the, the interest is broader than it ever has been. It's not seen as a niche asset or a hedge fund asset or a gold bug asset anymore. Pensions are taking it quite seriously. And um, in Europe, They've always held higher percentages of gold, generally physical, generally in the bank in Switzerland. I think they're getting more open now slowly to gold investments like equities. In North America, there's been um, almost zero interest and most advisors moved entirely away from it. Most big tech investors would not have held any gold in their portfolio. Generalists were down to minimal levels. So in North America, there's a bigger catch up going on right now. I think North Americans are more aggressively moving back in. 
And then in Asia, it's more of a cultural thing where gold has always been what you did to hide from the government. And um, that was on a very local physical level. So they continue to hoard gold almost as a family possession and um, a kind of counter government risk asset. Just in general, um, you know, we've seen the broadest interest going into bullion and equities are still lagging far behind that. Yeah. Yeah. Quick question on consolidation uh, in terms of the mining companies. We've seen some large transactions in terms of the senior miners and also it's expected to see more consolidation at the junior level. Maybe comment on some of the opportunities in uh, both of those segments. They're a little bit different, some of the rationale and reasons for doing some of the consolidation. Yeah. Well, the, the, the big companies have done a lot better price-wise, and they've, they've uh, really focused on cost control. They're, they're doing extremely well, and I think most of them are being rated pretty pretty much on the basis of their cash flows and earnings and, and what kind of growth those can post. So that's well covered, and they are priced, I think, appropriately, although still cheap as stocks in general, considering their growth. Um, the junior sector has been a disaster, and um, many junior projects now take 20 years to come to fruition. So you've got this constant process of diluting shareholders. They miss targets. They spend too much money. They were... Um, much more focused on promotion than running their companies historically. Gradually, that's changing, and the projects are getting better. They're, they're better. The engineering is better. The management is better. The governance is better. And so when the, the majors look around at ways to grow, I think they look at these juniors and they say, wow, I mean, we couldn't build that. We couldn't develop that. We don't have the timeline or the patience or even the community support to get what they've gotten done, we'll just pay, pay the premium when the right time comes. And I think you're in a constant shopping process now where majors will add junior projects. And, and so for us as an equity selection team, it's about finding the quality uh, companies that are not over promoted where perhaps they just went through a period where they had to raise some equity or where their, their, their equities were weak we're, we're bargain shopping in that sector and we're looking to catalyst rich companies that we think will be attractive candidates and in any case have a way to revalue themselves. So I think that's the, the shopping territory that we prefer. Two, two last questions. Uh, one about your ETFs. In very unique uh, products as I've looked at those, the, uh, both the, the majors and then the juniors. Maybe just a comment on how you've constructed those. Because sometimes ETFs are quite passive and there's not a lot of intelligence. I don't think they go into many of them. They just sort of slap together different companies, throw them all together. But uh, in, in your case, I think there's been some a really interesting uh, fundamental analysis that you've overlaid on both of those ETFs that they make them more attractive for investors. Well, yeah, we'd, we'd love to talk about those. We do think they're better products um, than the competition. Uh, ETFs, much like uh, bullion funds, tend to be popular first on the basis of liquidity, so massive investors can move in and out. And we've been lagging in our size, um, so they're not, they're not as popular as we would like them to be. But for smaller investors, they offer a real advantage. We have a, a, a computer function program which picks stocks on the basis of the best production growth and the best balance sheets, which we we think historically that's been the number one um, determinant for success. So a company like, for instance, Franco Nevada would have had great margins throughout really tough markets and, and posted some pretty good growth too. So we would be overweight the really high quality equities. That sometimes comes to haunt us in a real bull market. You know, the it's actually paradoxically the, the lower quality companies that, that rally. But in the long run, we're pretty convinced we're going to outperform. And, and we pick the juniors on the same basis. I think because our junior index is so much smaller than our, than our competition, we can pick more truly junior companies, whereas our competition is really a senior index across the board. 
And then lastly, your, now the, the last question, your best advice moving forward for uh, retail investors? <laughs> well, certainly it would be to consider some Sprott shares, uh, but I, I think that it just in general, look, to own gold bullion um, as a 10% as a part of your portfolio, that's pretty easy and low cost to do, and it's highly liquid. It should kind of be the starting point. And then you really need to do your homework on what else is, is good for you. Do you want a high quality stock that's going to pay dividends? Do you want you know something that's a bit racier and has the potential for 100 or 200% return? Then the research really starts. So I think do your homework and build your portfolio carefully. Don't rush in and do it all at once. Don't try and time it all at once. Just be there and and have the confidence that it's going to be a good two and three year period that we we're going to be in a good position with gold and silver <laughs> no 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 exactly yeah, there's so many different things we could talk about and uh, i think the point you said if the ecb and the federal reserve balance sheets top 20 trillion which it, it looks like there's there's no question that's going to be the case no way. these are just unprecedented numbers in terms of money printing and the deficits um, that governments are running now are again uh, something we've never seen historically. And these we, are didn't, we didn't even have uh, time to get into that, but that's that's also just starting. I mean, that's just going to add to the debt pile. Yeah. So anyway, thank you very much, Peter. Really appreciate your time and continued success uh, at the helm there of Spot. I think you're doing a wonderful job, and uh, look forward to profiting from both investing in your stock and also in some of your products so we thank you very much well, thanks for your faith thanks for your faith in us